our 2024 Black Health Story Month lecturer, Dr. Robin Spencer Antoine, who will present her, uh, her talk, All Power to the People, the Black, Panthers, uh, party, the Black Panther Party's Fight for Health and Wellness in the 1960s and 70s. Robin C. Spencer, uh, Dr. Spencer is a historian that focuses on Black social protests. After World War II, urban and working class radicalism and gender. Her book, The Revolution Has Come, Black Power, Gender, and the Black Panther Party in Oakland was published in 2016. She is co-founder of the Intersectional Black Panther Party History Project and has written widely on gender and Black power. Her writings have appeared in the Journal of Women's History and Souls, as well as the Washington Post, Vibe Magazine, Color Lines, and Truth Out. She has received awards for her work from the Mellon Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Association of Black Women Historians. She is completing her second book on the intersections between movement for Black liberation and the movement against the U.S. war in Vietnam as a fellow at Harvard's Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History in 2023-2024. Please, uh, please, I uh, would like to now welcome um, Dr. Robin Spencer Antoine. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you for such a warm welcome. I'm so honored to have the opportunity to speak to you about an aspect of my research um, that intersects with an aspect of your education, of your future practice um, as future medical professionals. So um, the first thing I want to say is that when I started out as an undergraduate at SUNY Binghamton, which is where I went for my bachelor's degree, I was an erstwhile pre-med student. Um, I didn't last too long in that track. The history bug came and, and took me in a whole other direction. But I definitely have a lot of respect and admiration for um, doctors, uh, nurses, others who um, dedicate their, their professions to um, being in the helping profession. So I really appreciate this opportunity. And I wanna thank in particular, um, Tiffany Delaney, um, Emily um, and Marino behind the scenes and everyone who worked so hard to, to bring me here. So the first thing I want to do is to share my screen with you. Uh, before I do that, because I will become a tiny box and you'll be able to see um, my larger presentation. So as I do that, I should say, I want to tell you a story about how I first encountered the Black Panther Party, the subject of my book. And it, had, it was a story about um, me as a budding historian who left New York to go to Oakland, California, to find more about this organization called the Black Panther Party that I had only read about. And so I wanna share with you what I learned in those initial encounters and um, give you a broader sense of the Panthers particular focus on health. So I'm gonna share my screen um, with you here. Okay, so imagine me, I am in my twenties, I am uh, in the middle of my graduate training and I'm off to Oakland, California to learn more about an organization called the Black Panther Party. I had learned a little bit about the Panthers perhaps as you may have uh, some, just some basic knowledge. I knew that they were an organization that had emerged during the period of civil rights and black power in the United States. I knew that they were an organization whose um, focus was on fighting police brutality um, armed self-defense, as well as other social programs. I did not know much about the social programs that they um, had put together. And I was going in this very first trip to figure out more about how to connect their social program and their vision for social transformation to their actions um, on the ground in Black communities around the country. The Panthers were, of course, founded in um, 1966 by Hugh Newton and Bobby Seale in Oakland, California. So that's what drew me there. So I come to Oakland and the first thing I wanna do is meet people who are part of this organization. I immediately realized that, um, you know, Oakland is a community that was facing a lot of economic challenges in that moment when I first did that research that was in the um, late 19, mid to late 19, 
um, 90s. And um, so I met with someone who was pointed out to me as a former member of the Black Panther Party. And he was like, well, I'll talk to you, but you got to come along and do what I'm doing. Like, I'm not stopping what I'm doing to talk to you. <laughs> so I followed along what he was doing. And what he was doing that day was tabling. He was tabling um, to raise awareness about the Black Panther Party's history and in particular their health programs. Um, so I stood next to him at the table and you know how pastors by love to be stopped and in the middle of what they're doing to be told and ask for different things. So that was our experience. But to my surprise, people were eager to stop, eager to see what was behind this powder blue flag that we had of the Black Panthers, eager to talk to us about their experiences with the Panthers, especially health. We ended our day um, going to knock on doors in public housing, offering people free healthcare. I had never done such a thing. Um, as you can imagine, I guess it was a different time where people, you could just go knock on someone's door and um, they would come to the door and engage with you. <laughs> but that's what happened. And we had the opportunity to talk to people about healthcare. People didn't believe that there could, was such a thing as free healthcare that they could access. We were simply telling them that they could come down to this clinic um, the one day a week that was staffed by doctors and dentists who would offer free services um, to members of the community. People were surprised by that. And we had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to hear um, Melvin Dixon, that member of the Black Panther Party, talk to people about why free healthcare matters. Um, and we got a chance to understand, and I in particular got a chance to understand just how visceral and emotional and um, incredulous people would be at this idea that they would be doctors and um, nurses and in particular, even dentists who were there at no cost to assess them, right? That was one of the first things I did. And it really planted a seed for me to kind of think about like this longer view of black health and how this organization called the Black Panther Party um, took up the cry for health equity, for health justice um, in Black and poor communities all around the country. And I went on to write a book about the Black Panthers. Health was a part of it. I looked at their educational programs. They were involved in many different social services, but I wanna focus on health here, right? Because I feel like, of course, it's Black Health History Month, and of course, I think that um, their focus on health had a particular um, impact and it has a particular legacy and it's instructive. It's really instructive, I think, to think about how they thought about dismantling um, and reconfiguring people's assumption about their relationships to the medical profession, to wellness um, and to health. And that's what they were doing. That was their vision of Black health. Of course, Oakland, California, um, where the Panthers were rooted and where my book is about, although the Panthers were a nationwide organization, right? So they started in Oakland, California in 1966. They grew to over 5,000 members in um, dozens of chapters, which were all over the country. They even had an international chapter. They spawned um, chapters also all around the world, from Israel to um, India, to Australia, um, all around the world. There were people who organized themselves under the banner of the Black Panther Party to fight for justice and equity in their own societies. Now, why health? Why health? In Oakland in particular, right, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale had attended the schools of Oakland, they had interfaced with the medical establishment in Oakland, and they understood that for many people, they could not even imagine the type of political work and ideals that the Panthers could do or could offer without having a strong sense of the bread and butter issues of daily survival. And health is one of those issues. Right. So they very much saw themselves as trying to address what they saw as gaps 
as um, constructed inequities in how black people in Oakland and also poor people um, were experiencing um, health. So I wanna talk a little bit more to give you a context of history and legacy and I'll do that throughout the presentation, but focus in particular on what they saw as their health interventions, right? Through this free health clinic movement, right? When I was in the 1990s offering people just one day, right? A few hours of one day where they could go in and have access to doctors and um, other medical professionals. Um, that was a pared down version of what the Panthers had been able to offer in their heyday in the 60s and 70s, which were actual medical clinics that operated all days of the week that connected people to medical professions, professionals every single day. Right. I want to talk about sickle cell anemia and how the Black Panthers understood that there was such a gap um, between um, the knowledge and the research around sickle cell and that testing could make such an important um, intervention in people's knowledge and people's um, ability to uh, make choices about their future based on, on what, what they knew. So they really promoted a lot of testing around sickle cell anemia and awareness. And they were very much um, at the forefront of doing that at a time where um, that uh, understandings of that disease was not um, very much centralized. And then nutrition and education, right? One of the Panthers' most well-known programs was a free breakfast for school children before school, where the children could show up and have a nutritious breakfast and have something in their stomachs to help them get through the day. As we learned, um, well, I guess maybe people knew, but I guess it came to mass consciousness during the first year of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, we learned that schools were playing such a big role in nutrition for students. When they couldn't have access to the in-person schools anymore, the nutritional element and the ways that schools were supporting um, you know, whole families and communities simply through the provision of you know, nutritious and oftentimes free or low cost meals really became part of the national conversation. And the Panthers uh, free breakfast program very much was a pioneer in raising awareness about uh, how important it was to, to have school children, um, you know, have this, these meals accessible to them. So first I wanna start with um, how we usually think about the Panthers, right? When I say Black Panther Party, you are not seeing, you know, young me, knocking on doors, offering healthcare. You're connecting with a history that centers the Black Panther Party as an organization focused on armed self-defense, as an organization that um, was connected with and speaking back to um, issues of police brutality and violence in Black communities at the time. You tend to see men, young men um, in militaristic wear, and that is kind of the dominant image of the Black Panther Party that persists. Now, instead, I love to offer a picture that recognizes that, first of all, most of the people who were part of the Black Panther Party by, by the late 1960s were women and that they did a host of things and they had a host of allies, including many from the uh, white communities. This is actually on the left there. Uh, someone uh, who's the Black Panther Party's international coordinator, uh, speaking out at a demonstration um, to Panther's many white allies, which they did have. You see a Panther woman registering people to vote. You see a Panther woman getting arrested. You see Panther women and men um, over stirring a pot, literally preparing the breakfast. And you see clerical work. These are the images that I would love for us to kind of replace or to um, complicate the images that we already have. And of course, uh, the provision of social services and health was a key part of that. So I wanna read from the Panthers 10-point um, platform and program, which was their uh, founding document, right? Their constitution, if you will, right? So point six of the 10-point platform and program 
1972 said, we want completely free healthcare for all black and oppressed peoples. As I mentioned earlier that their medical clinics, and even when I was knocking on doors, I was not just knocking on black doors, I was knocking on doors of people who lived where they lived. And that was a plethora of different types of people um, from Chicanos to um, poor white folks to, and everyone in between, right? Anyone who lived there had the opportunity to come down and participate in the, you know, the, the half a day of services that I was uh, had the opportunity to offer. So the Panthers 10 point platform and program in 1972 says, we want completely free healthcare for all black and oppressed people. Okay. We believe that the government must provide free of charge for the people health, health facilities, which will not only treat our illnesses, most of which have come about because of our oppression, but which will also develop preventative medical program to guarantee our future survival. So they're talking preventative medicine as well. We believe that mass health education and research programs must be developed to give all black and oppressed people access to advanced scientific and medical information so that we may provide ourselves with proper medical attention and care. That was point six of the 1972 Black Panther Party 10 point platform and program. And it gives you a sense of what they were arguing for. What was the larger vision? The larger vision was about health um, as something that should be available to all, um, something that should be equitable something that um, should connect people to having better lives, better longevity in community. Here's an example that I like to show um, of graph the, how the Panthers represented this graphically, right? Because in a lot of ways, they spoke to people, their audiences, we can say their publics in different ways. And they use a lot of images, right? Just to kind of get the message across. So here is the survival nurse uh, that uh, was created by graphic artist, Emery Douglas. And it gives a sense of what they saw as revolutionary, right? When you think about the Panthers, they were promoting revolution. What was that revolution? So the first thing to notice is that there's a button here that says, I am a revolutionary, right? And there's a nurse's cap that says people free health clinic, right? That was one of the programs that the Panthers began um, where people could come down and participate in um, the free health clinic movement. They created uh, over, over 13 health clinics that were available and accessible around the country where people could go and, um, work with doctors, dentists, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you see here the People's Free Food Program, they gave out free food. Um, the People's Liberation Schools, they created educational institutions. They created the longest lasting one was called the Oakland Community School. There's a great documentary about the Panthers, Oakland Community School, which is in development. The People's Free Clothing Program, the People's Free Shoes Program, um, et cetera. So here you see a vision of what the Panthers were uh, sort of promoting with their vision. And here you have, you know, also you see a holstered gun here, right? We can't ignore this, right? The Panthers were very much kind of an organization of self-defense, right? Really a strong believer in that. And this idea of the health clinics kind of anchoring it kind of being a way to fight back um, is key. And this idea of survival pending revolution. In other words, you cannot survive to be a voter even. You cannot survive to participate in the Panthers, um, other political programs. If you're hungry, if you're unhoused, if you're, you don't even have shoes, you don't have healthcare, right? So they saw it as creating these programs as a way of Helping to people, helping people to survive until the next uh, phase, until the next 
level. And that is what um, they promoted. And that those were the foundational ideas behind um, some of the programs that they, they developed. So here is an example of the sickle cell anemia testing, right? They held an, uh, an event called the Black Community Survival Conference in 1972. And here you have, you know, this vision of people lined up, you know, at a conference for different political reasons, but just having a booth there where people could go and get information about sickle cell anemia and be tested on the spot. Right? And the Panthers were actually responsible for thousands and thousands of, of tests uh, for sickle cell anemia. Here's a flyer from uh, a health clinic that the Panthers were opening. This is in Berkeley in 1971. And it says, the Black Panther announces the grand opening of the Bobby Seale People's Free Health Clinics, right? And it says here, a person's health is their most valuable possession. Improper health care and inadequate facilities can be used to perpetuate genocide on a people, right? And then they go on and they talk about the people must create institutions without our communities, um, within our communities rather, um, to ensure our survival. With that in mind, the Black Panther Party announces the opening of our first free health clinic in the Bay Area. And guess what? You can come down on the first day and get some free food and free clothing as well. So they very much were interested in bringing people in to a situation where they can have multiple types of, I guess what today we would call services, but they saw it as kind of things that people needed for survival right, pragmatic ways of addressing the very concrete needs that existed in these communities. And the goal was not to create a million of these health clinics, right? Let's get a Panther health clinic in every, you know, city, state, region, and country. No, the idea was to create enough of these clinics so that people would start to shift their understanding about their relationship to health and also think about their relationship to the state, right? To the government, right? Because they really wanted people to ask, well, if I can get free health clinic from an organization like the Black Panther Party, why isn't the government doing more, right? To build up and to allow for a situation where more people can have access to health care can achieve health and stability and things like that. They saw their health clinics as also an educational tool, right? And that is why they paired them oftentimes with giveaways, uh, being a place in a space where people could access other things like free shoes, like free um, food, those kinds of things. And of course, understanding that the very people who need the free health care might very well also be hungry, right? So that was very, very much key. And this was one, as I said, of 13 clinics that they eventually opened um, around the country. And these clinics would look, you know, very um, different in different uh, places as well. This is, uh, in, this was in Boston, the Franklin Lynch People's Free Health Center. Panther women played a big role um, in these clinics, uh, organizing within them, getting medical, um, staff to volunteer their time to go down and, you know, be the medical professionals that people would see, organizing um, educational things that could happen within the clinic, whether it be seminars around birth control, whether it be um, sort of interventions around diet and nutrition. The idea was to kind of expand what people saw as health into the realm of what people might think, well, I'm in good health. Well, what is good health, right? Really, they were asking that larger question. Is it the absence of disease or is it something else about your, um, your mental capacity, your um, ability to have harmony in your environment, your, you know, your vision for even social change, right? What was good health? And they really raised that question in a political way. And as you see, sometimes the clinics would be, you know, buildings that, you know, where Panthers paid rent, 
Um, sometimes they would be smaller facilities that were just rented out a few days a week or a few hours a week. Sometimes they may be structures like this. They were all over the country and they all looked different, but they all, I think, spoke to the similar philosophy, right? Now, the Breakfast for School Children program uh, was very, very central as well. The Panthers eventually would feed over 20,000 children um, per day in their free breakfast for children program. They ran it on a volunteer basis, as we would say today, but we can say that the people who were involved in the Black Panther Party were the staffers of the free um, breakfast programs. They would get up um, very, very, very early, sometimes five o'clock in order to prepare. They would solicit donations from merchants um, within the community and they would put together healthy and nutritious food for children um, in the breakfast programs that spread throughout, throughout the country. Um, the breakfast program was in over 23 cities and it had a huge impact. Uh, they were staffed and held in churches sometimes, community centers, et cetera. And it allowed for the Panthers to make inroads into places that um, may not have opened the doors to the Black Panther Party, right? Thinking and seeing only the dominant images that I started with. But when community members began to see everything that the Panthers were doing, their relationship to the community became one and the same, which doesn't mean that there weren't disagreements or um, areas of dissent or anything like that, but these breakfast programs were woven into the fabric of, of the community, right? Another example of the breakfast programs. I wanna point out that um, they were staffed by women as well as men who participated in the, uh, in the breakfast programs, who cooked the food, um, served the food, um, et cetera. And they also, at the time, in some of the breakfast programs, also talked to the students about politics, right? Sang songs with them, um, tried to give them a critical vision around Black history and Black education so they could really kind of have a strong sense of which way forward in these very contentious times that they were, they were in and they were part of. Here's another vision um, of the Free Breakfast for School Children program. As I mentioned, it was one of their um, most successful programs. It was later taken over by the federal government. And the Panthers is why, you know, you can go to any school in the US and before school, get a free meal for children without having to show any kind of income or anything like that to do that. The lunches are oftentimes, are, I think, typically based on income and you have to fill out all sorts of you know, paperwork in order to get those lunches, but the breakfast is for anyone um, who shows up. And it's really aligned with the Panthers vision and built on their model of really raising the question of childhood hunger and connecting that to the way in which uh, students of color, black students in particular, people without means, would, could not perform in schools because of the impact of being hungry on your ability to concentrate, to focus and all of that as I think more recent research um, has shown. So when we think about the Black Panther Party's uh, legacy and the lessons that we can take away, I think there are many, right? First of all, I think the Panthers show us how we can reimagine uh, political ideas and translate them into pragmatic intervention into the lives of people, right? So the Panthers focused on bread and butter issues. They took their ideals about social transformation and they wedded them to the social needs of the communities uh, that they served around the country. So they very much built a bridge to the heart of the community by focusing on health and wellness. They, another part of their legacy is of course, 
politicizing this notion of health and wellness, raising the flag on the reality that, of course, who you are, your race, your class, your gender, your uh, income level has a deep impact on health, right? What, how you experience health, what kind of health interventions you have, um, what kind of medical professionals you have access to and when you have access to them. All of that is definitely connected to um, the politics, right, of life. And the Panthers very much raise that question of, well, what is health equity beyond the right to health, beyond the ideal of rights or rights um, as possessions? They very much, I think, saw health as something that was um, intrinsic to the human condition and something that people had um, almost an innate need for, right? And they took the idea that, you know, we didn't have to wait for the federal government to do something about health or some institution or someone who was highly educated to come down and, and do something that from the grassroots, people could go and talk to other people, figure out skill sets, and people could help each other, right, to gain the kind of knowledge that they needed and work with people who would volunteer their time and donate their time to the larger effort. So they very much broke down barriers between um, what could be seen like a top-down relationship with you know, medical professionals in health, they very much tried to have a bottom-up approach. Like how can we organize at the bottom to connect, to bring in, to interface with people who can provide the kind of assistance and not just assistance, but people who can also kind of be wedded in the community. I should say that when I started off um, with Melvin Dixon, walking the streets of Oakland, uh, trying to talk to people and table and knock on doors. It was the community that he lived in. He did not transport himself down to, you know, some other area that he perceived to be in deep need. He started with the needs that were around him, right? And, and that was also an ideal that the Panthers had, right? This idea of um, working with where, working where you are, um, speaking to the people who are around you, that kind of face-to-face -face organizing, that sometimes gets lost in the media saturated, media mediated um, social relations that people have now. And I, I mean, I'm coming to you through Zoom, right? So I'm not saying that those um, technologies are not helpful sometimes and um, haven't improved certain elements of life, but they very much focused on that face-to-face, -face, even going to the doctors and to the nurses and asking them to give their time and to, um, to become part of their larger vision. Uh, this was part of a big movement that was happening around the country. When the Panthers started that first medical clinic in Berkeley, there were many free medical clinics that were popping up, especially in places like Berkeley in California um, and in other parts of the country where people were questioning um, the type of mediation between, I guess, patient and provider, as we would say, um, and trying to break down some of those, some of those barriers um, as well. So when we think about the Panthers, the Black Panther Party, they had a huge, huge impact socially, right? They had a huge impact in the fabric of people's lives. Uh, they transformed the way that so many people saw and understood this larger question of health. And that is an important part of their legacy that deserves more focus. And if you were to do research, like if you go right from this talk to Google or any search engine of your choice, you'll find people who have masters in public health, who have um, who've written in medical journals about the Black Panther Party's um, health impact. Um, it's not a secret. Uh, but it's not something that people know a lot about either, right? It's something you have to find. So I'm happy to have this platform and opportunity to just give you a window into this part of the Black Panther Party's history. 
I look forward to your questions. Please uh, put them into the Q&A window so that uh, we can talk and engage as we go forward. And I look forward to uh, learning from you and hearing what kind of questions you have. Thank you. I'm gonna stop the share. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Spencer Antoine. I'm going to start. I'm looking at the questions. And so there is a question. Um, um, fantastic presentation. Um, I'm generally aware of the federal government's efforts to undermine the Black Panthers by going after leadership, but did the government also target these more grassroots efforts that you described? Yes, they certainly did. And that's surprising to people. It's like, well, I understand why the federal government, you know, may have um, seen the Panthers as a threat, right? But they also saw these community programs as a threat. That is the key element. They saw these community programs as a threat. So yes, you can look, um, if you look up in any search engine, Black Panther Party, FBI, survival programs, you'll find a plethora of documents that show that one of the things that was done, for example, was to um, create bad press for the Black Panthers to try to destroy the relationship they would have with entities like churches and community centers and community groups who wouldn't want to be associated with anything negative or anything that were perceived as violent or anything like that. So when they would try to turn up the spotlight and to create false narratives around what the Panthers were doing, sometimes they would lose support in the communities or the local priests might be like, well, you know, I don't wanna continue this relationship. So that is one way that they um, challenge the Panthers community programs. Um, they definitely created a bad press for the Panthers. Uh, the Panthers I mentioned would get donations from merchants so they would try to intervene in those relationships of mutual support and mutual aid at the time. So the community programs also face a lot. Um, those are the ones that I can think specific to the food program, but there were other things that were done, especially um, using the federal, the mail service, um, their school was audited. Uh, you can think about any government agency from the IRS um, to the FBI. Um, the Panthers community programs definitely face that level of, of um, scrutiny, infiltration, harassment, undermining. And there was, um, there's a lot of documentation um, around that. And I think it speaks to the fact that these programs were seen as dangerous. You know, it's dangerous to have someone think, well, I can go to the doctor for nothing. Like, why is, you know, why is there so much, you know, financial barriers between me getting healthcare in all other circumstances when here's my opportunity to go to a medical professional who's treating me with dignity and not treating me like they're, you know, giving me something for free or that I'm, you know, lesser than because I'm in this clinic, you know, I'm being treated with humanity and I'm getting this for nothing. So it didn't make a lot of people think. And in fact, um, that was one of the reasons why it was um, targeted because it did have that, that impact, this, that kind of intellectual impact on people as well. And this, was, of course, was a time where many organizations, part of the counterculture, the new left, um, the movements um, amongst Puerto Ricans and um, Latinx people, we're also providing a lot of free, free things. There was an organization called the Diggers and their slogan was free everything. So this idea of commodification was really under assault at this time. And um, that was seen as you could imagine, you know, in a profit driven kind of enterprise as a threat. Thank you. There is another question. Um, do you know if any public school free breakfast programs predate the Panthers' efforts? And would it be accurate to say that they really catalyzed the need? Yes, I think it's accurate to say they catalyzed the need. I don't know of any 
programs before them. Um, although there might have been, I'm sure there was a program here or there. I can't say that they pioneered it with, with true accuracy, but I can say that they popularized it. Um, they kind of put the concept on the map of, and sort of made it into something that was part of mainstream um, discourse. I mean, I think that for many parents, uh, for many um, social scientists, <laughs> um, childhood hunger and the impact of childhood hunger was certainly, you know, something that was on their radar screen from the more pragmatic to the um, more intellectual. But I think that the Panthers kind of actualized a way of addressing that issue. And they were able to do it in a way that was um, pragmatic and achievable, right? Tables and chairs, free facilities, get up early, cook the donated food, right? And um, make it work, right? There was kind of a pragmatism. There was kind of a, they didn't see the barriers, right? Um, of course, today we're thinking, well, the food and nutritional profile and the storage and the refrigeration, and like, you know, we're thinking all of these things that could be connected to like, let's give free food to children before school, right? But this was a different time, right? And people showed up, people showed up um, they sent their children. It was very, very, very well supported. And there was it really did meet a need, a need that was very, very real. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that 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 speaks to the popularity of the program. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. Um, does the Black Panther Party still exist and work today? Also, are there models of their work in other places and countries that you're aware of? Sure, thanks for asking that one. There is, um, there's a lot of contention over the Panthers legacy, I should say. So there is an organization called the New Black Panther Party, but they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily continuing in the same light as the original <laughs> Black Panther Party. So the members of the original Black Panther Party that was started in 1966 in Oakland are still out there. They have a reunion every year in October. Um, you know, there was one last October, there'll be one this October and they come together and they do continue to, in addition to all the things that people do at reunions, you know, get together, dance, commune, talk about their grandchildren, et cetera. But they, also talk about their continuing political engagement. They oftentimes do come together and donate and serve the community. Um, former Panthers or Panther alum, their chapters around the country where people do, for example, do free backpacks for children. They are people who are feeding people here. I mean, not, I'm not in New York right now, but in New York, um, you know, there's parts of Harlem, you know, facing definitely economic deprivation. And you have former Panthers who are out there coordinating free and hot food giveaways on a weekly, monthly basis. So there are definitely Panthers who are still out there providing service. You know, the original Black Panther Party saw that it ended, right? It, it ended in a particular historical moment. Um, depending on where you were in Oakland, the last community program closed its doors. That was the Oakland Community School in 1982. And the Panthers ended it wherever they were at different moments. Um, and I guess the original members of the Black Panther Party who at this point, you know, are in their 70s and 80s. Um, it's a generation that is, um, you know, definitely has more yesterdays than tomorrow's. And um, so they're still out there telling their history, participating, but there's a new generation of people who are taking some elements of the Panthers legacy and moving forward. But there's not a, I wouldn't say that there is kind of a strong presence today of a new generation of people using the Black Panther Party um, social program models. Now in Tanzania, 
There's something called the United African American Community Center. And it is run by two Panthers, uh, Charlotte O'Neill and Pete O'Neill. It's in Tanzania, um, outside of Arusha, Tanzania. And there they have created a plethora of community programs that are helping the African community there. So they've got sewing classes, they've got um, a school um, that runs as an alternative to an orphanage, right? They help children, but they don't take them away from their family or anything like that. They, they help their family, they house, it's like a boarding, boarding situation where they can go there and get food and everything and be supported in school, but they're still part and connected with their family members. Um, they've got a lot of really interesting interpretations of the Panthers programs. And I love to point to that as an example of Panthers who are continuing to do the work um, in another country, who are continuing the legacy of the Panthers in terms of social service and community development. Uh, former Panther, well, late Panther Geronimo Pratt also went to Tanzania and was so impressed with the efforts. He lived there. He created a whole irrigation system um, you know, for the surrounding uh, villages. I mean, there's so much good that has been done by, you know, people who were aff affiliated with the original Black Panther Party. And that's an example of one in another country. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Spencer Antoine, uh, for this um, very engaging uh, talk. Uh, I also want to thank our audience members for attending our first Black Health Story Month uh, lecture. And um, I, with no more questions, I would say um, have a good afternoon to, uh, to all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.